My name is Michael Guyet, publisher of Lead Lag Report. Joining me there is Dan Davis. Dan, interesting to the audience. Who are you? What's your background? How did you get involved, interested in markets? And is there a lot of fraud in our industry? Well, first, a lot of questions that. I mean, my background is that way back in the mists of time, I used to be an economist at the Bank of England, where I got interested in financial crises, bank runs, all of that kind of stuff that happens only about once every 10 years. But when it does, it's very exciting. After a while, the civil service and me decided that we were going to make our fortune in different directions. So I was an equity analyst, worked for Credit Suisse, worked for quite a few banks that aren't around anymore, actually. Worked for Exxon BNP Paribas, covering mainly the global investment banking sector. Then about eight or nine years ago, I kind of semi-retired, decided to see a bit of the world and uh, write books of which my most recent published one was called Lying for Money. And it's all about financial fraud in general and you know, what it says about the economics. And I mean, the answer to your question, Michael, is yeah, there is a lot of fraud in our industry, but there's a lot of fraud in every industry because fraud is what you get when there is trust. And since the financial industry depends on trusts, it's always going to be an environment in which you have a certain amount of fraud. You know, you don't get fraud in very low trust societies, but then what that do the reason for that is that no one trusts each other, so they spend all their time checking up on each other and a whole load of legitimate business doesn't get done. So one of the main kind of messages of the book and of all the consulting work I've ever done on fraud Fair. is to always ask yourself the question, do you want to avoid every single fraud or do you want to be rich? I mean, I'd like to have both. <laughs> but, but no, fair enough. Okay, so, but okay, yeah. so, so, so and, and I think our, the investment industry is particularly challenged in this is that obviously you have a lot of regulation, but you also have a lot of parts of the investment industry which are not regulated, people that are not fiduciaries that hold themselves out as if they are fiduciaries and then people following and then taking advice based on that. Let's start with some of the, I guess, stories or more interesting kind of fraud dynamics that that you uncovered as you were writing Lying for Money? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, that's coming forward and on from the previous thing. The single statistic that kind of sticks in my mind the most is that in the 19th century in England, roughly 30 to 40% of all the stocks that were floated on the London Stock Exchange were frauds. And another 20 to 30% were not exactly frauds, but they were companies that were so flaky they should never have gone anywhere near the investing public. And so, you know, what that says to me is you can have a really high level of dishonesty going inside with a really high level of prosperity. It's really quite strange. The way I always kind of think about it is you only get fake gold mines being sold in real gold rushes. And so, I mean, the thing that sticks in my mind the most, because it tells me the most about the kind of how you start thinking about frauds is the Great Salad Oil Scam. Are you familiar with that one? No, no, please don't outline it. Right. So the Great Salad Oil Scam was an early 1960s American fraud, basically discovered about this, exactly the same day as the Kennedy assassination. And it was this guy who was the king of soybean oil trading. And he financed his soybean oil trading by getting warehouse receipts which he discounted with, at the time, the American Express commercial bank. And these warehouse receipts were entirely based on a farm of soybean oil tanks that he owned out in New Jersey. And every now and then, a guy from Amex would come down to the tank farm in New Jersey, check on the tanks, check they were all full of soybean oil, and lend him some more money based on the collateral of the oil in those tanks. But the thing is, Michael, oil floats on water. And so when you take a sample from the top of a tank, it's quite hard to tell whether it's a tank full of valuable salad grade soybean oil or whether it's a tank that's basically full of seawater with a few gallons of soybean oil floating on the top of it. And so consequently, the Tito De Angelis, his name was, ended up borrowing against a value considerably more than the United States annual soybean crop, and then just basically collapsing, leaving warehouse receipts outstanding 
for this tank farm that was basically full of seawater with uh, all of the oil kind of shipped off to uh, places unknown. And, you know, this was clearly an example of how a big fraud op- operates because this guy knew the industry intimately. He knew what kind of checks were being carried out. And so he was able to design the scam around the control mechanisms. You know, and that's the way that uh, big financial frauds operate. They are designed by people who know what you're going to check up on. Every time you decide what you're going to check up on, you are implicitly deciding what you're not going to check up on. And someone who kind of knows the industry inside out is going to be able to design something around your blind spots such that not only are you going to miss everything with your normal set of checks, but you're going to look really dumb after the fact because uh, everything that wasn't something that they knew you were going to be checking on is going to be completely fake. But I think the, the key part of that is the action part of checking, right? I mean, you can have laws and regulations, but unless they're enforced, it doesn't matter. I mean, Madoff, you can argue, yeah. worked around things, but the reality is he got away with it for so long because there just wasn't any real thoroughness. Yeah. I mean, you know, Madoff knew what was, you know, he knew what was in the rules, but he knew what was actually going to be checked upon. You know, and Madoff knew that if you kept everything secret, presented kind of results that looked really good and dealt through fund of funds providers who were completely dependent for their own business on their access to Madoff funds, you could immediately scare off kind of anyone who was planning on really getting access to the trade records. Madoff also knew that you could, as he in fact at one stage did, send the SEC an entire record of all your trading and they would only check them for things where they were suspecting insider dealing fraud and not check that many of those trades took place at prices that never happened on that day. You know, so yeah, it's all about, if you want to go into the fraud business, the irony is that the best fraudsters are people who could have done very well in legitimate business because they're always people who understand the industry perfectly. Are you familiar with Sam Israel and Bayou Capital? No, no, please talk about that. No, no, very similar fraud to Madoff's. There's an excellent book about it, so I can't recommend highly enough, because it's called The Octopus. And he was a very similar kind of Ponzi scheme fraudster to Bernard Madoff. And Sam Israel basically only accepted money from fund of fund investors. He didn't accept any money from high net worth individuals. And his reason for that was high net worth individuals tended to have sons and daughters with too much spare time on their hands who would hang around the fund management office asking awkward questions. He also developed the strategy of always sending paperwork to the prime broker at the last moment possible on a Friday so that it would end up kind of being covered by a heap of other paperwork on Monday and never checked up on properly. You know, and that's the sort of thing that happens. And the reason why it happens kind of deeply in economics is that this is an equilibrium phenomenon. You know, you can't check up on everything. Checking up on absolutely everything would be absurdly costly, both in terms of the direct cost of enforcement and in terms of all the legitimate business you would end up doing. And consequently, you have to select, what am I going to check up on? And if you do that, then you're effectively creating the negative template fraudsters. And that's why a certain amount of fraud is always going to be there in the market. And the interesting thing is, as I said earlier, that equilibrium can actually be high or low. It's not really a straightforward trade-off of less fraud equals more prosperity. You can have equilibriums with high or low levels of both fraud and prosperity. Presumably there are plenty of instances where there's fraud, but not necessarily intense. And the reason I'm framing that is, you know, there are plenty of entrepreneurs, I'm sure, that get branded as fraudulent because of the way they frame a particular vision that they have, which may never come true, but it's not necessarily a function of them being fraudulent as opposed to them just trying to be a visionary, right? And trying to build something different. So it seems like there's a fine line there almost to some extent, you know, on the edge of sort of maybe it's fraud, but yeah, maybe it's just like like Adam Newman, right? From Rework, a lot of people called him a fraud. Was he really a fraud? I don't know. He saw his opportunities and he took him. I mean, you know, it's, you get fake gold mines in real gold brushes. 
And here's something I talk about in the book, actually. And it's another example of this. Do you want to avoid fraud or do you want to be rich? Say, Michael, I put you down in Silicon Valley, California in, you know, the end of the 1970s. Okay. And you've got a perfect ability to spot a fake tech demo. How well do you think you're going to do as a venture capital investor with your ability to perfectly spot a demo that's been faked? And the answer to that I, question I is... more money than Powell, I think. Like, yeah, I mean, well, I think the answer to that question is you might do well or badly, but you would have to do super well in the lungs that you pick because that unerring ability to spot a faked demo would have kept you out of Larry Ellison's Oracle. It would kept you out of Bill Gates' Microsoft. You know, everyone faked demos in those uh, days. No, I love it. Okay, no, this, is a, this actually takes me back to like business cases I would study. It, it, it yeah. kind of goes back to the fake until you make it type yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and some of them do make it. And so, you know, as you say, you know, often these kind of things get identified ex post, depending on whether the guy, because, you know, no one holds it against Bill Gates, the first demo of the program that ended up being with Microsoft Windows was kind of a little bit of a cheat that couldn't really do anything except show that demo. If people put millions and millions of dollars into it and it turned out that it never developed into anything, people are going to look back at that and say, my God, that was a fraud. So yeah, you know, it's sort of, these things do happen and it's part of the definition of the crime also, because you kind of think of the types of names we have for crime. You know, you have gun crime, which is defined by one of the tools that are used in it. You know, you might have some, all kinds of other crimes. White collar crime is one of the few kinds of crime that's criminologically defined by the kind of people who do it. And that's, you know, really interesting to some criminologists, not enough of them. This is not nearly well studied enough by the criminological profession, because unlike most other kinds of criminal, fraudsters are not what you'd call deviant members of society. You know, they are professionals. They are people who look very much like legitimate businessmen and who mostly think of themselves as legitimate business people. One thing that's very noticeable about fraudsters, if you read their autobiographies a lot, as I did for a long period of my life, is that they've always got an excuse. They've always got a reason why it wasn't quite their fault or why someone else pushed them into it, or if they'd just been allowed to go on a little bit longer, everything would have been all right. And that's what the criminologists call the rationalization. That's the kind of psychological construct that they put together to make the actions that they're doing consistent with their view of themselves as not a deviant membership, not a deviant member of society. Now, the worrying thing about that rationalization is that once it's there, it seems to be that it's there forever. Once someone's developed that ability, they're always going to come back to the well. And that's why one of the biggest assets of any short selling firm, one of the most crucial things for anyone in the fraud detection business is a list of people who've been associated with previous scams. Because if you say have a good database of scammers, then when you see something come to the market with even one of those names associated with it, you can usually short that stock before you even know what the business does. So I, it's funny timing because I just started watching on HBO Mac this telemarketers docuseries around the scam of telemarketing from Civic Development Group. It's actually a really interesting oh, documentary. And, and what you just mentioned actually leads into next episode, which isn't released yet, around, you know, they got told to be shut down by the FTC. And then like within a month later, the guys behind Civic Development Group, which is one of the largest telemarketing scams ever in history, just did it all over again. Yeah. And uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the crazy things I discovered when doing the research for my book. Almost none of the cases that I ended up writing about in Line for Money was it a first offense. Quite often, you'd had a guy who had committed a crime done time for fraud and then come out again and everyone had said, well, you know, we've got to give this guy a second chance. You know, you wouldn't necessarily give a shoplifter or a drug dealer or a mugger a second chance, but somehow someone who's falsified accounts, he's someone who looks like you and me. He's someone who looks like 
a non-deviant member of society. And so people decide, I'm going to give them a second chance. And they get a second chance at managing even more amounts of other people's money. And predictably, you know, the amazingly obvious thing happens. Why is that? What's the psychology behind that for those that believe the repeat offender, even though they have the facts on their side as far as what's been done in the past? Is it, is it as simple as just people gravitate towards confidence that people are maybe sympathetic and they, they love a sort of a comeback story, a road to retribution? Or is there something else that's psychological that you can point to? People gravitate towards confidence. I think that's a very good point. And also people gravitate away from conflict. You know, one of the most powerful weapons that a fraudster has is that they can look you in the eye and say, are you calling me a liar? And there's not very many people who have the kind of stones to look back and say, yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. Because we are generally educated and socialized into avoiding conflict. In particular, we are you know, without getting too far into kind of evolutionary of biology here, we are educated and socialized very much against initiating conflict with high status males, particularly if you're a lower status male. That was something I learned pretty early on in my career as a uh, bank regulator, which is that chief executives of banks are, for the most part, high status males. Bank supervisors and regulators are, for the most part, low status males and females. And so it's profoundly psychologically difficult for someone working for, take a random example, the San Francisco Fed, to talk to a successful CEO of, take a random example, Silicon Valley Bank, and tell them that they've got to change their business model. You know, and there's nothing fraudulent about the Silicon Valley Bank, don't get me wrong, but it's the same kind of dynamic that makes it very difficult to confront someone who is confident, but who is doing something that's wrong. And somebody you want to get hired away to, right? I mean, I do think there's always an element of that whenever there's you know, a checking out against fraud. You know, if somebody's such a status, it's you know, how that status can maybe be bestowed upon you, the person that's checking. I, I don't know. I see what you're saying there, Michael. But in my experience in, you know, when I did this, which was admittedly, you know, closer to 20 years ago, the people who are most easily captured are the life, they're the people who become institutionalized and who don't kind of, because that is the thing about fraud detection. Going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the way that people design frauds or design bad activities around the checking system, that means that the only way to detect them is to think a little bit outside the box, to kind of check up on something in a way that no one's thought to check up on it before. And in general, if you're looking for a civil service thing, something like the FCC, something like the uh, Federal Reserve Bank supervisors, it's the ones who get hired to other jobs who are usually the slightly more original thinkers. They're the people who do get hired to uh, private firms, unfortunately. The ones who stay behind are the guys who tick boxes, get home by 5 p.m. and try not to have any original thoughts and make trouble for themselves. And that's how we get most of the big supervisory screw-ups we've had over the last few decades. Right, which I do think is why it's important to have firms that, you know, at least when it comes to the public market, you know, are doing these kind of deep dives and saying, no, this company is a fraud and here's the fundamental reason. Because, you know, they have a profit incentive, right? Whereas the public regulators don't. Yeah, no, absolutely. They've got a profit incentive. And also, more independent firms like the short sellers are much more likely to employ difficult people. There is one thing, really, that all of the good short sellers I know have in common, and that they are slightly tricky people. I mean, I, 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 the I, personality was the disagreeable personality trait. They don't score high on being agreeable isn't one of their priorities. I get on fine with them because I'm kind of a you know, disagreeable guy myself. The greatest single bank regulator in the history of bank regulation is a guy called Bill Black, who wrote a book called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. And he was the guy who every American taxpayer should thank for ensuring that the SNL crisis wasn't at least twice the size that it was. 
And, you know, I've read his biography and it's a story of, according to him, how he was right on absolutely every important issue of the day and how sometimes people around him were able to overcome their many personal failings in order to admit it. You know, I read it thinking, this guy is an actual American hero, but my God, I'm not planning any long fishing trips with him. And yeah, people like that, not only do they not necessarily fit all that well into civil service organizations, not many of them are going to fit in well to big investment banks. Not many of them are going to fit well into big fund managers of any sort. It's always the independents and the mavericks and the guys who are kind of true believers with firms of four or five people and who, you know, are constantly getting blocked and banned on Twitter or what have you. Those are the people that you're going to have to look to find fraudsters because those are the only people who don't have profoundly strong psychological barriers against the sort of conflict and against the sort of thinking that detects fraudsters. Is it fair to say that there's maybe a link between easy monetary policy and the prevalence of fraudsters? I, yeah, I have to assume if money is cheap, it's a lot easier for people to, to believe anything. Whereas, you know, if the cost of capital is more elevated, there's going to be a higher standard there. Yeah. I would say it's easy credit terms rather than easy money, monetary policy, but we're kind of splitting hairs there. And to an extent, you have the kind of cost of capital arguments, which you know probably does make a difference that when the opportunity cost is so high, people are more inclined to invest in all sorts of things. But also, remember, fake businesses don't generate real cash. You know, or fake businesses only generate cash for their owners from you know, from investors. If you have to make interest payments, or if you have to make kind of a monthly payment in cash, that's a big constraint on your ability to grow a fraud. So, you know, just simply that discipline of having to come up with the monthly payments on your bank lending facility, that's kind of a check and balance in and of itself. If you're close to zero interest rates, and if you're not having to generate any cash to show the outside world, then you can grow a lot faster. You know, you can grow your fake books a lot faster. One of the big kind of things that always develops in fraudulent enterprises is that the moment you start committing a fraud, you put a wedge between the real books and the public books. And that wedge is going to grow at a compound rate because the public books are showing a growth rate of X. The true books are showing a growth rate of X minus. And that wedge is itself a compound growth item. That's why frauds tend to snowball. That's how someone like Bernard Madoff ended up committing you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of fraud in order to steal barely one billion of actual cash. And that's a phenomenon that's easier to manage when interest rates are low, just simply because the overall numbers can be that much lower because you're not being expected to come up with cash all the time. Right. It, it enables the runway for fraud to be longer, I think is the point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me just reset the room for the remaining minutes here. Everybody, please make sure you follow Dan Davis here on X. If you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be a podcast under Lead Lag Live on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Okay, you put the book out, I believe, in 2018. And we had a little thing called COVID, which had a whole bunch of fraud in the way that Tim Thistle was pushed out and things that we saw, you know, at least in the immediate months afterwards. Any sort of interesting insights on that period of time in terms of just well, lying for money when the government was throwing it at us? Well, I mean, I mean, I'll put it, the book out with, came out in like 2017 in UK and then a year later in USA. And then, yeah, we had the COVID period. And it was interesting because I was being asked a bit about the kind of stimulus program over here, which was not quite as generous as the US one. And my view at that time was what we're trying to do here is maintain a kind of demand in the economy. And so I was tended to take the view frauds to spend money just like anyone else. You know, in a situation like this, you're going to have some fraud, just like when you start a war, you're going to have some war profiteering. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just 
realize that fraud is a cost of doing business. It's particularly a cost of doing business for the government because the government usually has to provide a reason for its decisions, whereas a private business can just say, I don't like the look of you or I heard bad rumors about you. The government can't do that. You know, but then you come in and try and detect and punish it ex post rather than sort of trying to prevent it ex ante. In general, I think what I came away with from all the time I spent working on fraud is that we probably do, if anything, too much work on preventing fraud and nothing like enough uh, work on punishing it ex post. And in particular, making sure that anyone who has been tempted once, you know, has to make their career doing something which doesn't involve being trusted with other people's money. Which does happen in the financial markets, right? I mean, you can be banned from trading stocks, obviously. I mean, yeah, the guy, the, I forget his name, the Wolf of Wall Street guy, yeah. right? He's banned, but he's still trading cryptocurrency. Right. See, that's the trouble. Yeah, you, you can be banned from trading stocks and then show up again as a consultant. You can be banned from corporate finance and show up again in crypto. You can be banned from like one jurisdiction and then turn up halfway across the world. It should be easier to actually ban people permanently. One thing that kind of has always interested me as a store, as a strategy for dealing with this, is that one of the few markets where there's very little fraud these days is in UK mergers and takeovers. And that's certainly not because of a lack of overall fraud in the London market. It's certainly not because uh, London small caps are a really honest place, God knows. But the takeover panel of the City of London has a rule that if you've been caught out doing something to effectively defraud minority shareholders in a takeover, you'll be put on what they call the cold shoulder list. And the cold shoulder list has the interesting characteristic that if anyone works with someone on the cold shoulder list, they get added to the cold shoulder list. And because of that, in general, anyone who's been on the wrong end of a City of London takeover panel penalty doesn't get to do that kind of business anymore. And it's pretty effective as a deterrent. Consequently, in general, I think we should all do much more adopting the rule that someone who works with a crook is quite possibly a crook themselves. Guilty by association. No, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's not exactly democratic, but you know, it's a good principle for, you know, it's, there's no democratic requirements to give someone your money, you know? Yeah, you basically describe my entire strategy with uh, yeah. blocking on X. <laughs> with my, with what I <laughs> on social media, I block the person in any way that likes or retweets yeah. those posts or posts. But I, it, like I do think yeah. there's a, you're valid in. I mean, I I can see that clearly, right? And now there's arguably there's some people that will associate, yeah, you know, just not knowing because there's a level of yeah. ignorance or information asymmetry. Yeah. But certainly on a you know, on a la large company scale, yeah. there's no excuse for that. Yeah, you know, and also you know, if you find stock that's a scam, make a note of who their public relations were, make a note of which stockbrokers were involved in promoting it make a note of all the advisors involved, you know, and then if you see those names crop up again, you know that's one that you don't have to get interested in. How does tax policy factor into the likelihood of increased fraud? And the reason I'm going with that as a question is, I think it's fairly, fairly straightforward, right? If taxes are onerous and overly high, people get desperate, so they feel they need to circumvent more just to live. Yeah. Is there any connection there between, you know, tax policy and increased problems um, fraud? I think the way that it goes is that this is almost your route to a low trust economy. Because, you know, if we think about somewhere like, uh, I don't know, Nigeria or Lebanon or, you know, the stereotypical low trust societies, they have low levels of private sector fraud because people only do business with close associates, friends and family, but very high uh, levels of fraud against the government. And the reason for that is that the government is the entity that has to be involved in everyone's economic life, but it's also an entity that can't be involved in close, tight-knit circles of trust. And the trouble with that is that it comes back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of the rationalization. Once people have rationalized a little bit of dishonesty as not making them a bad person, once people have developed that habit, it's there, you know. And not everyone who fiddles their taxes is going to also con their neighbors. But, you know, it's a step along the road. It's a step along 
the road to poor compliance with all sorts of regulations. And, you know, that's how you get to be a low trust society. People stop trusting the government. They start believing that it's okay to fiddle their taxes. They start kind of having to fake their taxes because it's the only way to live or survive. Once you fake your taxes, you start thinking it's okay to maybe pay a little bribe to a public official. Once you've bribed a public official, you might bribe a private official. And pretty soon, you know, you are, without ever having noticed a change in your own character or morals, you've become a fraudster. So, you know, that's, it's the start of the path, if you see what I mean, Michael. Which is an interesting, I would think, psychological evolution study, right? Sort of at what point does somebody in going a little bit further down the line, at what point do they see themselves or realize that hey, this is now a bit much, now I am actually a fraudster? Yeah, and usually the answer is never. Or the answer is when you're in so deep that you can't really admit it and change your ways because the thing about fraud is it's a recurring crime. If you're a shoplifter, you can just get up in the morning and decide to stop shoplifting. You know, if you're a mugger, you can just wake up in the morning and decide I'm not going to be selling anyone up and steal their wallet today. If you are an embezzler, you have to conceal the existence of the crime itself. You know, you can't stop being a fraudulent accountant. You can't suddenly declare all of your tax income to the tax man for the previous 10 years. It's another thing that kind of is the weirdness of financial crime. One kind of policeman I sort of talked to put it this way, you know, if a house has been burgled or a car's been stolen, it's pretty obvious what the crime is and you've just got to find out who did it. It's you're looking at a fraud or a financial crime. Usually, as soon as you can work out that a crime has happened, it's pretty obvious who did it. The trouble is always proving that there's actually been a crime. Well, so that's another interesting way of thinking about it because, yeah, you can argue that more data makes it easier to identify you know, the source and what's happening. But is, does the data get you to the conclusion that there was an actual crime? That's, that's a totally different animal. It's tricky, yeah. You know, and th this is kind of the subject of the book I'm working on at the moment, which is the overall industrialization of decision making and kind of the use of data for these things, because I, I got incredibly interested in this at the time, which is that for a lot of things, data will help you a lot. But, you know, and this is relevant to stock investing in general, data will also tend to increase your confidence in the decisions you make. And that can be a very dangerous thing. You know, a system which increases your confidence in the decisions you make, independent of whether they're right or not, can be an extremely expensive thing. You know, that's why you don't hear as much about old data in the hedge fund world as you used to. Let me tell you about, you know, Medicare in the 1980s and 1990s was probably the biggest fraud the world has ever seen until the banking industry took it back in the 2000s. There are credible non-political estimates which reckon that at the peak of Medicare fraud in the late 1980s, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the payments made under that program were fraudulent. Uh, and that was entirely because big Medicare insurers had optimized their systems to process claims as cheaply as possible. There were one or two Medicare insurers that had fraud rates literally a tenth or less of the industry standard. And those were the ones that realized that, you know, did this business by paying the right claims, not by paying every claim really cheaply. And in general, you know, there's a great book about this, the case study of one of the insurers that got it right. They got it right by never having the same loss adjuster working on two consecutive claims from the same kind of clinic. So everything would get checked out slightly idiosyncratically slightly differently in a completely kind of man-made decision-making process. They just didn't take advantage of any of the benefits of computerization and industrialization. And that meant that they avoided almost all of the really big industrialized uh, Medicare frauds. So yeah, the thing about data is that it tends to, even if you use the most advanced algorithms possible, you're still industrializing the decision process.
And that means you're standardizing it. And that means you're going to get standardized decisions and standardized decisions against an adversarial kind of process out in the world can be very dangerous indeed. Is there anything to the idea that there's almost a Lindy effect to, to scams, to frauds, just the longer that something's been out there, the less likely it's perceived to be a fraud, that you know, time is connected to this? I mean, I think that's certainly true. And I think it's, it's almost kind of derivable from the maths. You know, if, if you think about what I was saying about the difference between the public books and the true books, that wedge is something that's going to grow at a compound rate. Anything that grows at a compound rate for 10 or 20 years is going to get absolutely huge. And that's how scams tend to fall apart. So if you think about like the rogue trader scams, the sort of Nick Leeson, Barings Bank, the Joe Jett, Quigo Adaboli, all of those kind of guys, the way they got caught is that the difference between the numbers they were reporting and the numbers they were generating just became so huge, it couldn't be explained away. So the longer something has lasted, the more likely it is that there has to be at least something there. And that's why Madoff was so completely atypical. He found some way to get out of the normal cycle of checking up on a hedge fund and the wedge between the true books and the kind of numbers he was reporting to his clients just became absolutely outlandishly huge. So, you know, with, as I say, notably rare exceptions like Bernie Madoff, yeah, the longer something's been around, the more likely it is to be genuine. I don't think that's a perception. I think that is kind of almost falls out of the maths of compounding. I had actually interviewed Nick Leeson on one of these spaces, I want to say a year ago. And uh, it was actually really, yeah, no, and it was actually really, his story is remarkable in that, yeah, it's kind of like the road to hell is paved with good intentions. His, yep. his initial action was actually to try to help out a fellow yep. colleague or trader, right? And it just yep. metastasized in something he couldn't control. So it goes back to your point. It's like, you know, you don't know if you're a fraud until you're probably too deep into it and then you can't turn back anyway. And that's kind of what happened. You know, at almost every stage, you know, and obviously you have to kind of take some of these people's words with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But in Leeson's case, I absolutely believe it. At almost every stage, he thought he was trying to do the right thing until, you know, about a year in, suddenly you realize you've done so many wrong things that there ain't no way back out. And all you can do is carry on and hope for a miracle. Yeah, escalation of commitment sort of uh, yeah. always goes back to that. Uh, of all the different fraudulent cases or stories that you looked at for the book, what was one that was perhaps the most fantastical that you looked into and said, you can't believe this actually happened? There was one that I actually didn't believe it happened because the first time I came across a bit was in a work of fiction based on the lead character. But the Portuguese banknote scandal involved a guy called Arturo Alves dos Reis, who managed to, he decided that counterfeiting individual banknotes was too small time and too high risk of getting caught. So he counterfeited the signature of the governor of the Bank of Portugal on a letter and then took it to the firm that printed the official banknotes. And the letter basically said, you know, we want to carry out monetary finance for a project in Angola, which we don't want to tell the Portuguese parliament about, as was the style in the politics of the day. And he got the official banknote printer to run him off official banknotes equal to something like 3% of Portugal's GDP at the time. And the only reason he was ever caught is that in one bank, someone accidentally stacked one of his fake notes next to a real note that had the same serial number. And they had the bad luck that the bank inspectors were in that day. Um, and this actually brought down the economy of Portugal. They had a currency crisis. They had to withdraw all of the notes and print new ones. And the consequent economic collapse brought to power a fascist government that ruled Portugal for the next 50 years. So you know, it was the most macroeconomically significant fraud I ever found in the book. And it was just crazy. It was something that you thought this could not possibly happen in any 20th century economy, but it did. Talk about a butterfly effect. I mean, yeah. do you keep that one signature instead of having some ramifications yeah. like that. I mean, that's, yeah. and, but it does go, it does emphasize this point that, you know, 
a single fraud can have all kinds of unintended yeah. consequences on society. Yeah, you know, and what it also illustrates is that there's just a circle of trust. And once you've got that official looking letter with the signature of someone whose word is unquestionably trusted, you can take it to a banknote printer who's not going to check up on it because you don't check up on things that are inside the circle of trust. And then once you're inside that circle of trust, there's almost no limit to the amount of harm that can be done. Dan, for those who want to track by your thoughts and, you know, just, I guess, to learn more about what you put out in your books, aside from going to Amazon, where would you point them to? Well, I'm on the X Twitter app, uh, D Squared Digest. I guess anyone who's on the space can sort of see me there. That's got a link to my Substack, which is called Back of Mind. And Back of Mind these days is not so much about fraud as about systems thinking and industrialized decision making. It comes out once or twice a week and, you know, I've sort of got reasonably good feedback on that so far. Other than that, I mean, to be honest, I do bits and pieces of consulting, but the nature of the work is that if you're ever looking for my services, you're probably in a bad place. So I wouldn't wish that on any of your listeners. Everybody, please make sure you follow Dan here and check out his numerous books. And hopefully I will see you all. Thank you, Dan. Really do appreciate it. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Michael.